Welcome to the Cataraqui Woods Dental Implant Institute, a nonprofit organization with a mission and vision to further both education and research in the field of oral implantology. My name is Dr. Waji Khan. I am a dental surgeon and also the course director for an online YouTube lecture series, which has a series of online lectures provided as a service to the profession of dentistry to deliver a literature and knowledge-based approach to dental implant education for practitioners interested in learning more about how to implement the discipline of oral implantology into their clinical practice. This online course should be merged with a suitable clinical course and long-term mentorship study club program so that the learner can maximize their benefit from the didactic online program. The production of this series of lectures was partially funded by an educational grant from the International Dental Implant Academy. This is Lecture 5, Finalizing the Treatment Plan and Consent Law. So a summary of the lecture is as follows. Proper patient evaluation and treatment planning is vital in ensuring the success of dental implant treatment for everyone. Collection Collecting all of the information which has been gathered in the preliminary assessments and formulation of a written treatment plan is also essential. Documentation of the communication process, ensuring that all the I's are dotted and T's and crossed is also very important, as our discussion of costs and ongoing costs with maintenance is also advised. Giving pamphlets or handouts in this regard and asking questions of the patient can also help to confirm understanding and avoid embarrassing miscommunication. So the question is why? Well, the main reason is in the United States of America, around 11% of all medical malpractice cases involve dentistry. And as we all know, the road to hell is lined with good intentions. Nobody intends on there being a negative outcome for a patient. However, when negative outcomes occur, either uh, outcome-based or in terms of communication, they can never have uh, a positive outcome for everyone. So we're going to talk about consent law here. And consent law is basically composed of four elements. And these elements are referred to as, number one, capacity, number two, specificity, number three, referability, and number four, disclosure in terms of the procedure, material risks, and specific questions. So we're going to talk first about capacity. So from a consent perspective, the page, there has to be four things that need to be covered. So for the first thing we're going to cover is capacity. So what is capacity? So if you break it down into its simplest uh, form, capacity basically asks the question, does the patient have the ability to make decisions for themselves? And if they do not have the ability to make the decisions for themselves, in Ontario, in Canada, there's something called the Healthcare Consent Act. If not, does the patient have a legal substitute decision maker who can make decisions for the patient's best interest? And it's important that you, uh, you understand the last point here. Is there an individual who can make decisions for the patient's best interest? Not for their best interest, but for the patient's best interest. And if the clinician has any doubts about whether the, pa the substitute decision maker is making uh, a decision not in the patient's best interest, there are, uh, there are venues through the Healthcare Consent Act uh, in which uh, one, can, uh, one can apply and ask for uh, uh, additional uh, intervention. Uh, one final note about capacity. A sedated patient, so someone who's under the influence, uh, may not necessarily have capacity to make decisions. Uh, this is important as sometimes in the treatment process, uh, we begin treating a patient and uh, lo and behold, uh, midway through a procedure, realize that what we were planning to do or what we advised the patient during the consent process is no longer what we are actually going to be doing. Uh, as such, if a patient is deemed to not have capacity, you cannot just ask them uh, right there and then, oh, by the way, we said two implants, you're going to need four. Oh, yeah, sure, go ahead, go ahead, go right on ahead, go ahead, do that. That's not a bright idea and not something which we would suggest. In such a case, it would be best to uh, stop the procedure, basically uh, get the patient uh, into a, a state where they can be stable, uh, send them home, discharge the patient, reappoint them, and uh, uh, bring them back in order to have this discussion. Uh, the alternative is that when one is discussing uh, treatment in the consent process that you uh, foresee 
uh, possible changes that can take place and that you inform the patient as part of the consent process that there may be uh, changes uh, in, in the treatment plan. Uh, for example, uh, many times when I'm doing a root canal for a patient, I'll inform the patient that should we be uh, doing the root canal and find that there's a crack where the tooth is not salvageable, or restorable, uh, we may just make a decision to extract the tooth. And most patients, I mean, most common sense would say, most people would say, yeah, all right, well, you're there already. I'm not, I don't want to come back. However, if it's the case that the procedure involves sedation, um, you can't necessarily just assume that the person would have uh, uh, wanted to have done this. And uh, if, for normal people who have capacity, uh, who don't necessarily have a substitute decision maker there, so if, for example, you're working on a husband and the wife is in the waiting room, uh, you could go and ask the wife. But once again, it's not one of those things that I would necessarily suggest. So this is either something which needs to take place, uh, sorry, a conversation that needs to take place uh, as part of the consent process in terms of uh, uh, treatment uh, changes that may have to be, to be made, uh, uh, or uh, you'll have to reappoint the patient and do it at another point in time. Uh, it's, uh, the concept of having to do it at another point in time is also um, very important for if there's going to be significant cost changes to the patient. So if all of a sudden you have to go from uh, a treatment plan where uh, you are thinking you're just going to be placing implants to all of a sudden uh, you get inside there and you realize, oh boy, we need to do some bone gra grafting or sinus augmentation or another implant's going to be required or uh, another procedure is going to be required. Uh, if there's going to be a significant cost change, uh, it would be wise to be having this consent discussion uh, with the patient when it's uh, known that they have capacity. So number two we refer to is specificity. This uh, becomes a little bit less uh, winded of a, a discussion. Uh, specificity is basically that the specific procedures and subsequent procedures that have been described in detail are going to be done. So uh, namely, uh, you, uh, you is, when it says specific procedure and subs subsequent procedures, I'll discuss a case which I had this morning, a uh, patient who I was doing a consent process for, uh, for an implant in the uh, posterior uh, premolar area uh, after conducting a routine clinical and a radiographic examination, it was determined that the patient's going to basically need to have a, a sinus lift uh, and a, 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 um, a implant placed along with the concurrent uh, soft tissue augmentation in order to change the soft tissue biotype for the patient. So the specific procedures, the sources of the grafts, uh, all those details were described in detail for the patient uh, as opposed to uh, just mentioning to the patient that you're going to be just placing an, an implant and then afterwards uh, they ask you, oh, what about this bone? Where did it come from? What about this soft tissue? Where did this come from? So uh, specific, uh, getting as specific as possible in your consent process is, um, is advisable. We then refer to referability. Referability is basically that the procedures to be conducted have been referred to the practitioners who are going to perform those procedures. Uh, and this becomes very important in uh, group practices where uh, it may not be necessarily uh, one practitioner who will be seeing the patient uh, for treatment or for follow-up or even for emergency procedures. Uh, so uh, uh, it's very important to make sure that this aspect has been discussed with the patient. Many times when I'm seeing patients, patients will ask me, is it you that's going to be performing the procedure? And I say, yes, I will be performing the procedure. Uh, unfortunately, based off the, the education-based healthcare system within which we exist, many patients are already uh, uh, accustomed to having consent done by a certain uh, clinician and then uh, having either resident doctors or students uh, work on them. So uh, most, most, most uh, patients, uh, they're sort of seasoned to this sort of, uh, this sort of environment. So we need to remind patients that uh, we are going to be working on them or who's going to be working on them. Uh, it's also important from a referability perspective if it's the case that you have uh, auxiliary staff with you that, that when patients are in for their procedures, sometimes when we do implants in my office, I'll have my, uh, my assistant with me. Uh, sometimes there will also be a second assistant who's uh, either helping out with just setup or helping out taking photographs and that sort of stuff. So in the routine dental office uh, uh, treatment um, team, uh, patients are usually very uh, accustomed to just having two people there. So when they see a, thir they see a third person, they're wondering what's going on. 
Uh, sometimes with sedation as well with nurses and members of the sedation team, there can be sort of a mini football team in the room. So it's very important to make sure that prior to uh, either sedating a patient or to starting a work on a patient that, that there be a form of a checklist in terms of introducing each member of the team and what they're going to be doing and so that the patient is very clear that it is uh, if it's just you working on them that you're the only person that they're going to that is going to be working on them and that they shouldn't expect uh, any other surprises. The last thing we discuss from the consent process, the, or at least the elements uh, that are required for a proper consent, is disclosure. And in disclosure, there's basically uh, a number of things uh, you, should need to, you need to go over, but to just break it down into its, uh, its bare bones basics, disclosure is basically describing the procedure uh, and the material risks. And material risks are sort of dependent upon the patient. Uh, so for, uh, and uh, elective procedures have a higher standard uh, of, of disclosure that needs to be uh, needs to be given. So in terms of uh, disclosure also you, you must be uh, willing to take specific questions from the patient. So w when I speak to a patient uh, about uh, about a certain procedure, I'll inform them that this is the procedure that we're going to be conducting and these are the material risks and I'll answer your specific questions. Uh, as I mentioned in the slide, material risks are dependent upon the patient. Uh, so for example, uh, in some patients, uh, for example, I had a patient who was a um, a, uh, in a band and played a trumpet and so uh, one of we were working on this patient's uh, anterior tooth and the, for those of you who've ever played an instrument uh, uh, using your mouth you'll know that it's uh, especially at such a high level you'll know that it's uh, it's very dependent upon uh, using your lips and your musculature and to a certain extent your, your teeth to support those uh, tissues so we had to inform the patient that by doing the procedure that we would be doing uh, initially when there would be no tooth there that there would be some uh, changes and then at the end uh, we wouldn't be able to necessarily guarantee that the soft tissue or sorry the hard tissue support for his lips or his musculature would be the same as as before and this can have significant uh, implications or uh, long-term implications for a patient uh, in the sense that uh, it may uh, not necessarily allow them to perform uh, what it is that they were previously doing so it's always important to make sure what your patients do what line of work they're in uh, you know if they're I had another patient who came in for a dental uh, implant tr uh, treatment consult uh, back in May and it's you know uh, uh, we were talking all about everything we're going to do and all this sort of stuff and basically she informed me that okay perfect let's set this up for July and I find out from her uh, uh, from her through my assistant that her daughter is getting married in April sorry sorry in August so like two weeks after the procedure and we were basically looking at doing a procedure in which there was bilateral grafting and uh, you know six to eight implants on the maxilla to help retain a um, a removable prosthesis and I said okay whoa 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 uh, ma'am uh, do you understand what is going to happen uh, during this procedure and the post-operative uh, uh, sequela that's going to take place and uh, she didn't really understand this so I mean it could have almost have been a nightmare for us uh, to have operated on this patient in July only to find out that this patient uh, would have been basically going through the post-operative healing phase uh, during her daughter's wedding and this could have had implications in terms of her daughter's wedding, pictures, and uh, other things like that. And I mean, it's not necessarily that there would have been some sort of litigation or legal uh, aspect coming out of this. Uh, I mean, from my perspective, that's the least of my concern. My greatest concern is uh, providing the best care for my patients and making sure they know that uh, I care about them and that I care about the long-term outcome. So asking as many questions as you can uh, of your patients sort of helps you uh, guide, sort of helps guide you with respect to some of the material risks that you need to describe to them. And the next line underneath that is elective procedures have a higher standard of disclosure. Uh, I mean, we're not talking about a, a, a hot tooth or a root canal or an infected tooth that needs to go here. We're talking about, for the most part, patients who are coming in who are relatively pain-free, who are seeking uh, increased um, retention uh, or stability of a prosthesis or re replacement uh, of missing teeth using something like dental implants. So uh, despite the fact that w it's not necessarily uh, elective like uh, going to get uh, uh, breast augmentation or a liposuction or something along those lines, something a little bit more functional in terms of what we're doing here, uh, nonetheless, uh, it, is, it is suggested that there be as much disclosure as possible. 
and then finally specific questions answering uh, the questions that the patient uh, asks of you uh, I always tell patients patients will always say to me hey uh, doc can I can ask you a stupid question I always say you know what there's no such thing as a stupid question only a stupid answer so go ahead and ask whatever it is that you want Continuing along with disclosure, we're going to uh, talk about the duty of disclosure and the standard of disclosure. So uh, with respect to disclosure, there are a uh, bunch of sub-elements that need to be discussed. So is there a duty of disclosure? Well, basically, this is a no-brainer. Uh, as a clinician, you have a duty of disclosure to your patients uh, in order to have a proper uh, uh, element of consent, that being disclosure. So you need to inform, you need to inform your patient that... Uh, they that they need to uh, there so there is a duty of disclosure on the part of the clinician uh, so then it becomes the standard of disclosure so in terms of standard of the disclosure we talk about material risks and answering specific questions and there's a few important uh, Supreme Court of Canada cases that basically uh, came down uh, back in the 1980s the first would have been hop versus lap which would have been uh, the beginning of this standard of disclosure and the second being uh, Rebel versus Hughes uh, which were both uh, basically uh, given by Chief Justice Borlaskin at the time. Uh, those of you who are history junkies, Chief Justice Borlaskin was also the individual uh, who was the uh, was the uh, a Supreme Court Justice uh, who was present during the repatriation of the Constitution Act in 1982. Just a bit of an aside there. What came of these two cases, what, what they refer to as the modified objective test. Basically, what they refer to as, but, but for not knowing a certain tidbit of information, would this specific patient not have consented to getting this treatment done? So in the case of Rebel versus Hughes, uh, Hughes, uh, Hughes was an orthopedic surgeon. Rebels was basically getting some back surgery done. Uh, Rebel was months away from basically uh, uh, getting uh, a pension from a, uh, a, a company he was working for. As a result of uh, getting some back surgery done, there was a small, small, small percentage likelihood uh, that this individual would have become paralyzed. Unfortunately, Rebel suffered significant injury in this case, and Hughes's defense basically stated that the likelihood that this would have taken place was very, very, very low. Uh, the court did not agree with lower courts, uh, the Supreme Court that being, that Rebel would have consented uh, and having known this and the main reason they suggested this was that had any average competent prudent reasonable individual known that they were six months away from getting a pension and that there was maybe a one in 100 chance of being paralyzed from this most people probably would have said you know what I will wait say I this isn't urgent this doesn't need to be done right now uh, I will wait six months in order to get this done and if there's if I if something happens at least I'm I'm fine or I'm, I'm covered with the with my pension so this is an important case to highlight because many times in dentistry a lot of the things that we do they aren't necessary they don't necessarily need to be done like right right now then and there like, uh, and, and notwithstanding an endodontic lesion or someone who has an infection or someone needs to get a tooth out sort of right away most things are rather elective and the more elective things get the more this modified objective rule becomes pertinent and it sort of behooves us as clinicians to ask our patients as much detail and tell them about even any tiny remote possibility that there's going to be an issue and what we can do in order to mitigate uh, that risk for them or at least uh, make it less likely to occur. Uh, in terms of disclosure, uh, the, the for, fourth, uh, third and fourth element are injury and causation. And so from a court's perspective, one of the sub-elements of disclosure is did the lack of disclosure cause injury and once again is, is causation. So uh, in, the uh, regulators basically recommend a number of uh, uh, items for patient's disclosure. Uh, the first thing to rec we recommend is telling the patient what their diagnosis is. Uh, the next thing they recommend is that the nature and the purpose of the dental implant treatment as well as the rationale for choosing it in this case is communicated and we discussed this back in the second lecture there has to be a, 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 a there has to be a sound clear uh, cogent reason for choosing dental implant treatment over other treatment modalities including no treatment at all an explanation of the risks and benefits of dental implant treatment, including the risk of dental implants failing to osseointegrate, all treatment options, including their benefits and disadvantages, 
The expected post-surgical sequelae, including pain, bleeding, swelling, bruising, other things likely to occur, and answering specific questions. Pre-prosthetic preparation in the form of wax-ups, surgical guides, photos, mod models, uh, trials if needed, like if you are going to change the vertical dimension in terms of an occlusal splint or the anterior guidance, uh, perhaps a fabrication of transitionals. Uh, we discussed this in the treatment planning lecture. There's nothing wrong with getting transitionals in there. It's a cheap, quick, easy, dirty way to try things out, and more or less you're taking what you're planning to do for a test run. And you can learn from that test run, uh, you make modifications to it, then all you have to do is uh, copy your homework and you're, you're home free. The required post-treatment care and monitoring. The likely prognosis and lifespan of dental implant treatment. How many times have we in our offices heard patients coming in saying, oh, I've heard dental implants last forever. Uh, yes, they can last forever, but your, t your own natural teeth can last forever too. And obviously they didn't. And so uh, these factors need to be discussed with patients and, and a realistic uh, outcome needs to be projected. Uh, the patient's responsibility for the long-term success of the treatment needs to be communicated as well. Uh, uh, so we're going to now discuss risk management. So in, or, in, in order to mitigate risks to yourself, uh, number one, an accurate assessment of the level of complexity of the clinical case and the surgeon's skill level to undertake it. Setting reasonable and achievable treatment goals. Uh, careful patient evaluation and treatment planning. Uh, appropriate discussions with the patients regarding the proposed treatment plan. Excellent communication between all members of the dental implant team. Never assume. We all know what assume is. We do not work in a silo, so we need to make sure that we communicate with all members of the team. So whether you're in sole practice and you're going to be the person who's doing the treatment planning, the surgical phase and prosthetic phase and follow-up, or if you're a surgeon, you're the person who's going to be placing the implant, you, it behooves you to communicate with the individual who's going to be restoring the implant. And it further behooves you if you're going to be throwing additional people into the mix, uh, for example, uh, other professionals like a periodontist or an orthodontist who may be involved in either moving teeth or in soft tissue grafting, or in, even in some of the people who work in the prosthetic field who will be providing the prosthesis. As the general dentist, you're sort of the quarterback, or if, even, uh, even if you're not the general dentist, uh, you need to find out who the quarterback is and ensure that all this communication is taking place. Employments of carefully evaluated and approved dental implant systems and ancillary equipment. So you can't just uh, g g take a, a company's uh, claims for granted. How many times in our offices have people come into our office and said, oh, wow, this is the latest and greatest product. Uh, I actually have a colleague, uh, Dr. Jeff Brucia, who actually once said something funny when I was, uh, went to one of his uh, lectures. If you haven't heard Jeff Brucia, you should. He's a great lecturer. Uh, so he basically said anytime a company comes in and says to him, here, try this product. This thing's the best. He always says, hey, jump in the chair. And they always look at him and say, what? And they, he says, yeah, you want me to try this product? Uh, let's get, we'll try it in your mouth. Let's go. And they all sort of give him a look. And he looks right back at them and says, you mean to expect me to try this product in my patients who are like family members' mouth without trying, without you giving me any sort of like uh, proper research or, or, uh, or follow-up? And, of course, everyone can present you with uh, research papers that have been published I'm not sure where one of the things we do in this uh, lecture series is we provide you with all of the uh, references that we have used and we are actually going to do a, li a literature review lecture as well to, to uh, talk a little bit about how to uh, uh, properly evaluate different studies and find out uh, what what angle they're coming from so you're that you're not just sort of left uh, drinking the kool-aid uh, from uh, from industry many times also many companies will make claims about their product about superiority or uh, about it, something being better. Uh, we, you, we, we as clinicians need to make sure that we have an ability to carefully evaluate these things and uh, the, um, ensure that the equipment that we're using and that the dental implant systems that we're using are top-notch and aren't going to cause any problems for us. Employment of appropriately trained dental staff is also important. Uh, so one may be wondering, okay, uh, I haven't really done very many implants. Uh, what should I do? Well, one of the things you can do is to take your dental, the dental staff to your implant training courses as well. Uh, one of the things that one of my colleagues who wanted to uh, start getting into implants, I just told them to have one of your staff come and watch me place implants. Or if you want to come over to my office and, you know, your staff can... Uh, 
uh, you know, see how we do things, and you can see how the best practices are employed in our office. Uh, we also try to keep a bit of a training book or training manual in our office for new staff just to get up to speed. And then also newer staff who have never placed an implant. Uh, it's kind of the uh, see one, do one, teach one uh, approach. Uh, so basically, we get them in to see how trained staff work, and then next thing you know, you're uh, you're doing it yourself with some supervision. And, and when we feel comfortable that you're able to do it by yourself, uh, you're able to work uh, with the uh, with the dentist or the dental implant team. Employment of best practices uh, for this procedure, and employment of best practices for infection preventive and control. Pre-surgical checklists. So checklists are something that the Air Force has employed in order to make sure that there's going to be no problems. So we want to do that in implant dentistry as well. So let's take a look at the patient's chief complaint and expectations and make sure that they're identified. Make sure that the medical and dental histories are completed and significant findings are identified. Make sure that any medical consultation or tests are performed and results are obtained. And then finally, number four, clinical, extra, and intraoral examinations are completed. So the presence of any oral pathologies, anatomy in form of bony ridges, intra-arch relationships and their position relative to the remaining dentition, that the occlusion has been addressed, that the quality, the localization, and quantity of bone uh, is, uh, is known, that the periodontal condition of the remaining dentation is documented, and that localization of favorable dental implant sites have been identified. Continuing with this pre-surgical checklist, radiographs and diagnostic tests are completed. So ensure that if you need study models, you have study models. That if you have need whatever periapical radiographs you require, what panoramic radiographs are required, tomographs, a dental CT scan if that was required, a diagnostic setup along with all of the ancillary things that come from that, that being stents, sur surgical guides, uh, model surgeries if they needed to be performed. Uh, Computer-guided virtual 3D planning software has been referred to. Number six, that the level of case complexity has been determined to be either straightforward or complex. Uh, this was back in lecture two. There was a big uh, section at the end of the lecture about determining whether a, uh, a certain case is going to be straightforward or complex uh, in terms of different variables. Uh, that a diagnosis has been established and that number Eight, a treatment plan and surgical prescription has been finalized. Number nine, that the informed con consent process has been fulfilled and documented. And number 10, that the surgical guide has been fabricated and preoperative instructions and medications have been provided to the patient. So the next lecture, lecture six, is the big enchilada itself, the surgical phase. Attached are a few of the references that we have used. Uh, in the production of this series of lectures. Uh, I would encourage you to refer to every single one because uh, they're all pretty good and they contain a lot of information that can expand upon some of the data points that we have included uh, in this uh, lecture series. On behalf of the treatment team at Cataraki Woods Dental Implant Institute, I would like to thank 